to Kesh. There we are. Yes, good morning and welcome to Cops Road Chapel on this uh, Sunday morning, the Lord's Day. It's lovely to see you here in front of me, the screens. Uh, if you are joining us this morning, welcome. It's a lovely sunny day and I trust and pray that the Lord will bless us richly as we meet for worship. We're going to be thinking much again about our Lord Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father, our great high priest, and his ministry in our lives as the risen Savior. So that's what we'll be thinking about today. Welcome. And if you are watching later on YouTube, I know some of you do, and especially if you're listening later on disc, and I know quite a few of you do that, well, I trust and pray that our service today will be of great blessing to you. We're going to begin with prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father, thank you for all your mercies and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for a lovely day. And thank you, Lord, for the privilege of Christian fellowship. What a lovely thing it is that God's people are able to meet together and God's people are able to see each other and God's people are able to come into your very presence this morning with our praise, our prayers, and our worship. And our Father, we thank you that as we come into your presence, we do not come to a God who is reluctant. We do not come to a God who is too busy for us, but we come to a God who is our Father, who welcomes us with open arms, who delights in us, Lord. What a remarkable thing it is that when we sing praises to your name this morning, this will bring joy to your heart. When we read your word and search the scriptures, this will please your heart. Lord, we can hardly believe it, but we thank you that these are the blessings of God upon your people. We thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus, seated at your right hand. And our Father, we pray that our service will be focused upon Christ. May we, Lord, have a new view of him. May we, Lord, understand more of his glory and grace and love for us. And may our hearts be thrilled by our God. So, Lord, please bless us as we gather, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As is usual in our morning service, we sing a number of hymns. Uh, we also have what we call a family talk. We have a, a sermon, and all these things will take place. Now, our first hymn this morning is based on Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. <laughs>
Now we have at this juncture in our service what we call our family talk when we're looking at uh, characters from the Bible and Mike, Mike Warren is going to do that for us. Okay, so um, we've got to the letter N. We've been working our way through and um, gradually. We weren't quite sure how far we get, but uh, it looks like we uh, probably get to Z, um, um, as probably. Um, so this week we've got to the letter N and I thought we would have a fairly well-known character, the character of Noah. And we've got a, uh, a short little video. Now, the video is clearly designed for those younger people among us, um, but I know that the older people quite enjoy this as well. Um, but what I'd like you to think about as we're watching this video about Noah um, and the flood and the ark, very well-known story to most people, I'd, I'd like you to sort of think about what, what does this story teach us about God and what does it teach us about ourselves so what does it teach us about God and what does it teach us about ourselves so I'm going to share the short video with you and it's only about three minutes long it just tells the story very simply but probe those questions stories of the Bible Noah this is Noah. Noah is in the Hall of Fame because he listened to God. God created the whole universe. He created the sun and moon and stars, the sky above and the sea below. God created the animals and the people. Over time, the people on earth began to do bad things because they didn't listen to God. There was only one man in all the earth who was different because he listened to God. That man was Noah. So God told Noah to build an ark. He told Noah exactly how to build the ark, and it was to be the biggest boat ever built. God told Noah to build an ark for his family and the animals to live on during the flood. When the ark was ready, God told Noah to load everyone into the large boat. They entered in pairs, each with another of its kind. After seven days, it started to rain. The underground waters erupted from the earth, and the rain fell in mighty torrents from the sky. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and then stopped. Many days later, Noah sent out a dove to find dry land, but the dove came back. After seven days, Noah sent out the dove again, and it returned with a branch. After seven more days, Noah released the dove again. This time, it did not return. This made Noah think the dove found dry land where it could rest. Noah lifted the covering of the boat and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. Noah trusted in God's plan and God protected his family during the flood. Now, the flood had come and gone and Noah, his family and all of the animals walked on land again. Noah built an altar and sacrificed burnt offerings to the Lord. God was pleased with Noah's sacrifice and made a promise to Noah that he would never again destroy the earth and every living thing with a flood. God put a rainbow in the sky to remind Noah and all mankind of this promise. Now, bear with me a moment while I just turn that one off. So, what do we learn from the story of Noah? And there are many lessons, but just some very simple and profound lessons. We learn, first of all, about God, that God, although God will not just look the other way when we sin, God will judge, God will destroy, because God is a just God. God is a merciful God, and he provides a way for us to be safe in the judgment. So God is a God who, who wants to do mercy more than he wants to judge. And he provided that boat, that big boat we call the ark, so that Noah could be safe. And the ark is a kind of picture. It's kind of a picture, an illustration of the Lord Jesus Christ, that God will judge sin. But if we come to Christ, just like Noah came and got in the ark, we have to get in the ark. I suspect the people around him were laughing at him, thinking it was the most strange thing. Probably had never rained before, and uh, certainly not like that. And Noah built that ark and got in it, and people would have thought he was foolish. And yet he trusted and believed God. 
So God is a merciful God who provides a way. And he has provided not an ark for us to get into, but he provided that rainbow in the sky that reminds us that there's a, a bigger ark, a better ark, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we get into the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, if we believe in him, we will be saved. So God is a merciful God. But what do we learn about ourselves? And what we learn about ourselves is we have a choice. We have a choice. Do we enter into the ark? Many of us here listening have done that. We've come to Jesus. We've asked him to forgive us and cleanse us from our sins and make, keep us safe. And if we've entered in, we will be safe. God will not judge us because Jesus has been judged in our place when he died on the cross. But we have a choice. And the ark is there and the door is open. And God calls us to enter in. And many walk by and say, well, I'm sure there won't be a judgment. I'm sure Jesus isn't really the saviour. And they ignore the open door of the gospel. Jesus says, come to me. Enter in. Get in the ark. Be safe. And we have a choice. So the question this morning for anyone listening, whether you're listening, you know, you could be listening five years later than this sermon was preached on the Internet. Maybe you are listening that now. Have you entered into Jesus? Have you trusted him? Are you safe? Thank you, Sukesh. Thanks, Mike. That's a very, very helpful uh, little study on Noah, one of the great stories of the Bible. And it does indeed point us to Christ, the Savior from sin. We're going to sing a lovely little song now. It is based on some words that Jesus spoke. And this song says, Jesus said, if I am weak, I should come to him. Keep us day and night We can hold 
based that song on some lovely words that Jesus spoke in one place. He said, if any man thirst, let him come to me. And uh, he said he would satisfy our thirst by giving us the Holy Spirit. And in another place, he said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. We have every reason to come to Jesus that we might find rest for our souls. We're going to turn to the Word of God, the Bible. We're going to read from a passage in the Bible. This is Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, and we're going to read verse 13 through to 35. Luke 24, from verse 13 to verse 35. Let us then hear the Word of God. That very day, Two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us, they were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who say that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if, they were, as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They say to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together, 
saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Well, we'll be looking at that passage a little later. We'll be looking at its teaching. We're going to come to God in prayer again. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do thank you again for the blessings of God that have come to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, we thank you that as we come into your presence this morning, we are mindful of this, that you are a God full of love and mercy and grace towards us. We thank you that you are kind and compassionate. We thank you that you are our Father. And as a father has compassion upon his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who love and fear him. And we thank you for that. And we thank you, our Father, that not only are you filled with love towards us, but there is a means by which your love is communicated to us, a means by which your love is brought to us. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is the intermediary between God and men. We thank you that he is the great high priest. We thank you, Lord, that he is the one who brings the blessings of heaven to earth and fills our hearts with the love of God and the grace of God. What a wonderful thing it is, Lord, that when we were alienated from you, when we were far from you, when we had no access to you and we had no means of getting access to you, you opened the ways of bringing us to you. You open the gates of heaven, and we thank you, Lord, for our Lord Jesus Christ, who brings heaven to us. We pray, Lord, as we come in our worship this morning, that your blessing would rest upon us. We pray that the Holy Spirit of God himself would come and channel to us the blessings of Jesus. May we, Lord, have our minds enlightened, our hearts thrilled, and our wills moved, by the word of God and by the presence of God in our midst. Our Father, we pray for our church. We thank you that this is the body of Christ. We thank you that the love of Christ rests upon us. We appreciate it, Lord, that there are times when we don't fully grasp the love of God. We look at our circumstances and we even have doubt. And yet, Lord, we thank you that your love is indeed upon us. We thank you that even when the sky is covered with cloud, the sun is still there. And Lord, even when circumstances seem to be against us, the love of God is there upon us. And we thank you for that. We pray, Lord, for this church. We pray that you would guide us as a church, Lord. We have major decisions coming up. Would you, Lord, give us wisdom and unity? May we be, Lord, of one heart, one mind, as we seek your ways for us. We pray, Lord, for the prosperity of this church. We don't look for worldly prosperity. We don't look for financial prosperity. We look for gospel prosperity. We look for conversions. We look for growth. We look for opportunities to minister to the needy people of this town. We look for ways, Lord, whereby we can bring the love of God to a people who know nothing of that love. We yearn to be channels of that love and channels of the grace of God. Would you, Lord, prosper your church? Would you grant us growth that we might indeed be a blessing to the people of this town? Our Father, we pray for our members today. We remember those, Lord, who are in much need. We remember the elderly, Lord, those who are very frail in body and mind. We ask for your blessing upon each one of them. We pray that you would sustain them and support them. We pray, Lord, for those who are ill at this time, for those who have serious illness in their body. We thank you, our Father, that you are so full of compassion and grace towards each one. We ask, Lord, for those who are ill, would you heal them, Lord? Would you restore their bodies to full health? Would you, Lord, minister to them? We pray for those who support and care for the ill, and we ask for your strengthening of them, Lord. Would you be very close to them and bless them? 
We pray, Lord, for any who are anxious. We pray for any who are worried. We pray, Lord, for any who feel troubled at this time. We ask for your blessing upon us. We pray that the blessings of God would be their portion in Christ and that you would, Lord, comfort and sustain and encourage those, Lord, who are in much need. Would you, Lord, bless your church, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we come to look at the Word of God, we're going to sing again a song that we sang last week. It's from Keswick, and it's called Take Heart. Thank you, Mike, for finding that uh, lovely little song reminds us of the grace of God, especially in our time of need. We're going to look at the passage that I've read a little earlier, Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, and verses 13 to 35, this very familiar story about two of Jesus' disciples on the road to Emmaus. Uh, it is after the resurrection, and uh, as uh, we read in this account, these are bewildered people. In fact, uh, Luke tells us that at one point in verse 17, they, they stood still looking sad. 
because they had all kinds of expectations. And in their minds, their expectations hadn't been met. And so they were walking to Emmaus. It seems they lived in Emmaus because when they got there, they invited the person walking with them to stay with them. So they were walking to this village called Emmaus. And this person, this man joins them in that walk. And that person, of course, is the risen Lord Jesus Christ. In this series of sermons that I'm preaching on Sunday mornings for the next few weeks, we are looking at the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Savior to his people. We as Christians believe that the Lord Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for our sins. We believe that when he died upon that cross, he took our sins upon himself. He paid the penalty for our sins. He cleared the guilt of our sins. He paid the debt for our sins. And he removed our slavery to sin and redeemed us. So our salvation from sin was secured at the cross. But then Jesus rose again from the dead on the third day. And Jesus then ascended into heaven. And Jesus is today seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, still at work. We must never forget this. Jesus' work has not finished. Jesus is still at work. And what Jesus is now doing, the risen Savior, seated at the right hand of the Father, he is bringing people into his kingdom, and he is preparing his people for their eternal heavenly dwelling. This is what he is doing. He is preparing you. If you're a Christian here this morning, you are born again. Jesus is at work in your heart. He is at work in your life, preparing you for your eternal heavenly dwelling. Why is it that you have trials in your life? Are these things random? Is it because the devil has total control and can act and do anything that he wants without answering to anybody? No. These things are not random, and the devil is not a free agent. God is in control of all things. So why do you have certain trials in your life? It is because Jesus is preparing you for heaven. It is because those trials will do you good. Those trials will shape your character. Those trials will deepen your knowledge, your experience of the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God. Everything in your life, every last detail has been arranged by Jesus for your good. And when you enter heaven, you will look back and you will see how God in his wisdom arranged all these things to shape you so that you are now in heaven, enjoying his love and his grace. This life is training for heaven, preparation for heaven, that we may enjoy heaven. So Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father, is at work in his people, preparing them for heaven. And in this series, we've looked at certain things. We've seen how Jesus deals with us when we have doubts. We saw doubting Thomas and how Jesus ministered to him. We saw how Jesus restores his people when they fall into sin. Last week, we looked at Peter and how Jesus appeared to Peter in the resurrected Jesus and how Jesus ministered to Peter, who had denied him three times. This week, we're looking at Jesus' ministry to these two disciples as they walk to Emmaus. And there are two things from this passage that I want to bring them, that I want to bring to you this morning. I just want to say this. The first point that I'm going to make this morning may sound very unusual. It may rather sound rather controversial, but I do believe what I'm going to say is from the Bible. So I have two things that I want to say this morning from this passage. And the first thing I want us to notice from this passage is this, that the risen Christ teaches his people the word 
of God. The risen Christ teaches his people the word of God. Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, is seated at the right hand of the Father. Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, is ministering to his people here on earth. Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, is preparing his people for their heavenly dwelling. Well, how is he doing that work of preparation? Well, one of the ways in which he's doing that work of preparation is that he teaches his people the word of God. You notice what happens in this passage. Here are these two disciples, and they're on their way to Emmaus. They're bewildered. They're confused. Things have happened that they never expected. They're totally confused. They cannot make sense of what has happened. And they're sad. They're, dis they're discouraged. They're depressed. And Jesus comes alongside them. Now, you notice what Jesus does. Jesus doesn't just speak some nice words of positive thinking or, you know, how some, you, you just sort of speak nice, encouraging words to people because you notice that a person is in a sad state. And so you just come out with some platitudes that are very nice sounding and they sound very nice and jolly and so on. Jesus doesn't do any of that. I want you to notice what he does here. He says, it says here, um, when we look at this passage from verse 25, he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He taught the scriptures to them. These weren't nice sounding, empty platitudes. These weren't just some nice sounding words that might bring temporary comfort, but actually have no meaning at all. This is Bible teaching. Jesus takes them to Moses. Jesus takes them to the prophets. And Jesus quotes Moses. And Jesus quotes the prophets. And they were Jewish people. They knew Moses. And they knew the prophets. And so Jesus quotes familiar passages. And Jesus says to them, do you remember that passage in the, in the law of Moses? And they, yes, we know that passage in the law of Moses. And he says, do you know that's speaking about me? And do you remember that passage in Isaiah, that passage in Jeremiah, Micah, Hosea? That, 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 these passages are speaking about me. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures things concerning himself. I want to say something to you this morning that I trust will be enormously helpful to you. You do not have to be intelligent or an intellectual or a Bible college graduate or a bookish person in order to understand the Bible. You do not have to be intelligent or an intellectual or a Bible college graduate, or bookish, in order to understand the Bible. You need the help of the Holy Spirit. There are people who are intelligent who do not understand the Bible. There are intellectuals who do not understand the Bible. There are Bible college graduates who do not understand the Bible. There are bookish people who do not understand the Bible. But there are people who know that their understanding comes from God the Holy Spirit and who go to God the Holy Spirit and pray to God the Holy Spirit for understanding of the Bible. And they have understanding of the Bible. Now, I'm not against Bible college. I'm not saying we don't need Bible college. I myself am a graduate and I've had formal theological training, I'm not speaking against it. 
I am saying that if we get this idea, and I think a lot of people have this idea, if we get this idea, if I'm not intelligent, you know, if I'm not academic, I didn't get A-levels. I'm more of a practical person. I work with my hands. I'm not an intellectual sort of person. I'm not the kind of person that reads theological tomes. I'm not the kind of person that does exams and goes to university. There are intellectuals who do that. I'm not that sort of person. I'm practical. Well, because I'm that way inclined, I can't understand the Bible. It's those who are intelligent, intellectual, academic, bookish, university people. They are the ones who understand the Bible. I'm practical. I work with my hands. I understand practical things. I nearly gave examples there, looking at people in front of me, but I won't. I understand practical things, and I can work with my hands. So the Bible isn't for me. You are wrong. I want to cite some examples from the Bible, and I want to cite some examples from history. Later today, read Acts chapter 14. You will find something totally remarkable in Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14 describes Paul's first missionary journey. And it talks about some towns in Turkey that Paul visited. He was on this journey. He was taking the gospel. So he set off and he, he, uh, he was with Barnabas. And there were these towns in Turkey where they had never heard of the gospel. They were not Jewish people. They were idolaters. They were people who followed other religions. And Paul and Barnabas went from one town to the next, to the next. They, they went on this journey. You can follow the journey on a road and you can say, right, so they're on this road. They visited this town and then this town and then this town. And in each town, they preached. And in each town, people became Christians. When they had got to the end of the road, they turned back. And they visited each town again. Now, when they visited each town the second time, now listen to what they did. They gathered the believers. Remember, these people had now become Christians. They gathered the believers, and they appointed from among those believers elders for the church. Those people had been Christians at most a few months. At most a few months. Because it's rather like if you go from here to Gloucester and you, you, you go to Portis Head uh, and then you go to Severn Beach and then you go to Alms, Almondsbury and you go to Thornbury and imagine you preach at each town, you get to Gloucester, you turn back and you, you retrace your steps. Well, it's not going to take you years to walk to Gloucester. It might take you, I don't know how long, it won't take you years. You get to Gloucester, you turn around, you come back. And in each town, you gather the believers and you appoint elders. You see what it's saying there. Thank you, Mike, for bringing this up. This is Acts chapter 14. Then they preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. These are three towns they visited on their way up. They're on their way down again. They visit Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Now look at verse 23. When they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. These people had been Christians a few months, but they were appointed elders. And you see what it says, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they believed. These people took up the teaching ministry. They stood the following Sunday after Paul and Barnabas had departed. A man would stand in front of the church at Lystra and he would say, brothers and sisters, I've been appointed an elder of this church. As an elder, it is my duty to preach the word of God to you. He would read a passage from the Bible and he would preach the scriptures to these people. Iconium, the same thing. A man would stand up and he would say to the congregation, God has appointed me an elder in this church. I'm going to read the scriptures. And they did it. 
they did it because it is God, the Holy Spirit, who gives understanding of scripture. The same thing happened in Crete. When you read Paul's letter to Titus, Paul and Titus visited the island of Crete and they visited every town on that island and they preached the gospel and people became Christians and Paul had to leave. So he wrote a letter to Titus and he says, now go to every town where we preach the gospel, where there are believers and appoint elders. Those people had only been Christians a few months. Now you may say, okay, this is absolutely crazy. Can I say this to you from personal experience? I have seen this in Africa. This may shock you. This is how I worked in Africa because I worked amongst unreached people. I wasn't the only one, I mustn't say I, we, there was a group of us. And we worked amongst unreached, we worked amongst people who'd never seen a Bible. I remember going to villages which had never seen a Bible. I remember standing in front of people and saying, do you know what this is? And well, they'd never seen a book. They'd never seen a book of any kind, let alone the Bible. And we would gather them under an acacia tree and we would preach to them. And some of them became Christians. And then a few months later, we would say, right, we've, we've got to go back to Nairobi now. But we, they've got to be in a local church. Because this is God's will, that all Christians belong to a local church. And I remember looking at these men, and we prayed about it, and we said, right, this brother, and this brother, and this brother, they will be elders. We held a service, and we appointed them as elders. Those churches, to this day, are thriving and growing. God, the Holy Spirit, gives teaching to his people because Jesus, seated at the right hand of God, gives teaching through the Holy Spirit. Let me cite a couple of examples from history. If you were to ask who was the greatest preacher in Britain in the 19th century, the 1800s, the Victorian era, the answer has to be C.H. Spurgeon. Spurgeon was a preacher in London, and every morning and every evening, 6,000 people came to hear him. Do you know Spurgeon never went to Bible college? Spurgeon never had formal theological training. Spurgeon was a Baptist, and when he was a young man, it was illegal for a Baptist to go to a Bible college. Only Anglicans could go to Bible college. That is a fact. So Spurgeon never went to Bible college. At the age of 17, Spurgeon became a pastor. And he saw, I don't know how many tens of thousands of conversions. Today we read his books. I've translated his books into Swahili. They're full of superb Bible teaching, depth and clarity. He's not superficial. Spurgeon is not, you know, uh, simple and just superficial. There is depth in Spurgeon. There's a depth of knowledge, a depth of understanding. I'm blessed by his sermons. I love reading Spurgeon because he's such a full, it's such a bless, uh, a blessing in his teaching. Never went to Bible college. Go a century later to the 20th century, the 1900s. Who was the greatest preacher in Britain in the 19, in the 20th century? Well, one of the great answers has to be Martin Lloyd-Jones. If you've never heard of Martin Lloyd-Jones, go on the internet and Google him. All his sermons are on the internet because they're all recorded. And Martin Lloyd-Jones is generally regarded as the greatest preacher in Britain in the 20th century. Martin Lloyd-Jones never had formal theological or Bible training. Never went to Bible college. I repeat, I am not against Bible college. I myself have had formal theological training. I found it beneficial. I am making the point that when we think there's only one way to understand the Bible, and that is to be intelligent, intellectual, bookish, and academic, and go to Bible college, and if I'm not intelligent, intellectual, bookish, and go to Bible college, I can never understand the Bible. You are wrong. You're robbing yourself of tremendous blessings. Let me challenge you with this. Have you ever understood Malachi? 
Have you ever understood Second Chronicles? Have you ever understood Second Corinthians? Now, why not say to God, I would like to understand your word? Will you teach me? Will you teach me? Why not? You know, it becomes like uh, one of these things. People often say, well, I, uh, I'm no good at languages, so I can never learn a language. They've never tried. You know, I say this, I'm no good at gardening. Now, I've never tried gardening. I just, just I've, I've, I've convinced myself I'm no good at gardening, so I don't do gardening. And people are like that. We mustn't get like that about the word of God. The Holy Spirit teaches us the scriptures because Jesus sent him to teach the scriptures. This is one of the ways in which God prepares his people for the heavenly dwelling. Friends, this book is full of blessings. This book, when we read it, study it, and understand it, thrills our hearts. Do you notice what they say to each other in verse 32? Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures. Our hearts were thrilled when he opened the scriptures to us. That is an experience every Christian can have. Take hold of a book of the Bible, a book that you've never read, perhaps, or never understood, and you say to yourself, I can never understand Malachi. I can never understand Second Corinthians. Well, say to yourself, I'm going to pray God will teach me and read it. And as you read it, pray and ask God, the Holy Spirit, to teach you. Malachi, 2 Chronicles, 2 Corinthians, whatever. Ask him. Go in faith. Because Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, teaches his people the word of God. So that's the first thing I wanted to teach this morning. The risen Christ teaches his people the word of God. The second thing I want us to understand from this passage, and it is this, that the glory of Christ is revealed in all the scriptures. The glory of Christ is revealed in all the scriptures. It says in verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures, all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Jesus was saying something very remarkable here. He was saying, when you read Moses, you're reading about me. You're not reading about Israel. You're not reading about Abraham. Now, of course, Abraham is there. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, yes, they're all there. But Jesus is saying they're all there because they're all teaching about me. When you read the prophets, he's saying, you're not reading primarily about Israel. You're not reading primarily about Babylon or Egypt or anything like that. All of them, he says, all of them teach about Christ. This is one of the great things in the Bible, and Christians have overlooked this to their detriment. We've looked for other things in the Bible. We've forgotten that the whole of the Bible is all about Christ, because the whole of the Christian faith is all about Christ. What is Christianity? Christianity is Christ. How do you live the Christian life? You live the Christian life by grasping the glory of Christ. Your mind and your heart, they grasp the glory of Jesus Christ. They understand the love of Christ, the grace of Christ, the mercy, the compassion, and the kindness of Jesus Christ. You see more and more and more of his love and grace and mercy and compassion. And as you see more and more of his love and grace, so you love him more, you live for him more, you obey him more, and you put to death sin because sin displeases him. It is all about Christ. It's all about the glory of Christ. The moment we focus on anything else, we've lost our way. Christianity is Christ. You want to live the Christian life, discover Jesus Christ. Discover his glory, his love, his grace, his mercy, his wisdom, his power, his sovereignty, everything about him. He is the most beautiful person this universe has ever known. He's the most wonderful person. 
You know how when you see something truly beautiful and you meet instinctively, admire it, your heart leaps. I was talking to somebody the other day about a place in Kenya where we used to go as a family called Crater Lake. And it is one of the most beautiful sights this earth ever has. And my family and I, we used to walk there and you climb up this hill and you then on the, list, on the lip of a crater, a volcanic crater, a, vo a volcano had taken place and it's now a crater. And there's a turquoise colored lake and acacia trees and hippo in the water and buffalo among the trees and colobus monkeys and eagles fly. I mean, it's, well, it's heaven on earth almost. And when we used to stand there, I mean, we went, I don't know how many dozens of times, but every time we went, we would just stand and look at this crater in front of us. And we would gasp at the beauty of creation. There is something about beauty that inspires admiration. Well, Jesus is beautiful. I wonder if you've ever thought of it like that. Jesus is beautiful. He's wonderful. He's lovely. He's attractive. He's gorgeous. He's glorious. And the more we see Jesus, the more we understand his love, we see depths of love and depths of grace. He is so wonderful. Our hearts instinctively are thrilled and we love him and we love him more. The more we see him, the more we love him. The more we love him, the more we obey him, the more we honor him, and the more we live for him and speak for him. It's all about Christ. Don't look for anything else in the Bible. Every part of the Bible reveals Jesus in his glory. And that is what the Christian faith is about. So two things from this passage. The risen Christ teaches his people the word of God. And the glory of Christ is revealed in all the scriptures. Praise God for his son and for his word. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it speaks of Christ. Lord, we pray you'd help us to understand this. Help us, Lord, to have faith and to believe that you can teach us the scriptures. Help us, Lord, to dig into the word, to study the word prayerfully in faith that we might truly understand your word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our last hymn is actually a Christmas carol, but it is about Christ. And we've been speaking about Christ, so we're going to sing about him from the squalor of a borrowed stable. the squalor of a borrowed stable, by the Spirit and a virgin's faith, to the anguish and the shame of scandal, came the Saviour of the human race. But the skies were filled with the praise of heaven, shepherds listen as the Through the kisses of a friend 
Let's pray. We thank you again, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for a lovely day, the Lord's Day. Would you bless our meeting this afternoon, Lord, we pray. And bless us through this day, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.